Hello, everyone. I'm Brandon Turkis, managing editor of MotorOne.com, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. Global editor in chief John Neff is out this week. It's near the end of November, which means the auto industry is beginning its annual migration to sunny Southern California for the Los Angeles Auto Show. Joining me to discuss what we can expect next week in LA is senior editor Jeff Perez. How are you, Jeff? Good. How are you, Brian? Oh, very well. And Motor One contributor Chris Bruce. How's it going, Chris? Good. Great to be here. Great to have you here. All right, let's dive in. So the LA Auto Show, especially over the past few years, has earned a reputation as the green show. There's a lot of plug-in and electric and exciting stuff there, advanced stuff there. And this year's edition of the show is going to be no different. If you look at our big slideshow that we have on motor1.com, it's almost exclusively dominated by plugins and electrics. And one of the most important, one of the most anticipated, we're actually going to see on Sunday night is the Mustang Mach-E. Ford announced the name of it earlier this morning, and there's been a lot of conversation about just the name, that this is a member, a full member of the Mustang family. But we're also waiting to see what it's looked like, and we've published spy shots and some other exciting stuff of it. And Jeff, I wanted to ask you, since you're going to be hearing all about the Mach-E over the next few days, what do you think about it? What do you think so far of the name, of the styling that we've seen, of the promises that Ford has made with this car? I like everything so far. There's really nothing that I've seen that has turned me off to the concept, um, except maybe the dash in the name Mach-E, which is totally unnecessary. I don't know why they did that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's my not, <laughs> not my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, but I, I like the use of Mustang in the name. I like the fact that they're really leaning into the Mustang thing. I think it, it'll work. I mean, it's EVs now are, are hard. I mean, you see Tesla does it well and other companies are doing it well, but it's hard to really like break into the space with something exciting and interesting. But I think this will do a good job of that. You don't see much of you know a backlash from, from the enthusiasts because it's already we've seen in the comment sections from our website and from other websites of people saying, I can't believe they've done this to the Mustang name. They're diluting the brand. You don't think that's going to be an issue as this car comes forward, as it you know begins to enter the marketplace? I think that people on Twitter are going to continue to complain about it, but then they're also going to continue to buy Mustangs. I don't think it's going to change anything. I mean, there, there are going to be hardcore Mustang guys that will complain and but it's not going to stop them from buying Mustangs. They don't have to go buy this one. But I think, if anything, this just opens the brand up to a new buyer, more consumers that even if they're not Mustang people, they'll, you know, they'll see this and they'll associate it with the Mustang brand, quote unquote, and be more interested in buying it. Chris, what about you? you you've been following along with all of this Mustang Mach-E nonsense. What's, what's your feeling on it? So, I mean, I, you know, we've been seeing renderings and more recently spy shots forever. I, I think it's going to be a bigger success than a lot of people who are just reacting to the name now think it is. Um, hopefully we'll find out it has a nice big battery and a lot of range and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for Ford to have a success. And it also opens the door. Keep in mind, this is kind of their first real EV. Like, I sure, there was the focus, but, like, this is the first real, real attempt at a competitive EV. Um, and it's just going to open the door to more. So as an opening shot in the, in the fight, I think it's going to be fantastic. How do you think it's going to shake out? This is a question for both of you. How do you think it'll shake out with the Tesla Model Y coming? Do you think this is going to be, you know, a case of of a legacy automaker finally taking a real proper shot at Tesla in its own wheelhouse? I suspect, much like the Taycan uh, Model S stuff, that it's going to be a case of two vehicles that happen to be electric, but aren't necessarily direct competitors. And by that, I mean that I suspect the Model E, or I suspect the uh, Mach-E to be um, a lot more aggressive, a lot sportier, just because of the Mustang name. I don't you know, know yet, but the Mustang name says performance. So I kind of expect that to be a little, handle a little better, be a little, you know, kind of rougher, just, yeah. That type of thing. Whereas the Model Y will be a great, great on the highway like the Model S, but maybe not quite as nimble in the corners. But we'll see. 
Yeah, I sort of expect that too. I, I think with a Model Y, it's fine. It's safe to say that it's not going to be like a great, you know, performer. Not that we sort of expect that, but putting the Mustang name on this sort of implies that it's going to be fun to drive, right? Uh, or th- at least that's what we hope. Uh, and I think yeah, that's we- going to be <laughs> the big, the big differentiator between that and the Tesla. I mean, put it this way: if it's not fun to drive, then Ford failed. By, because by that's, putting the Mustang name on it, that's the implication. Yeah, it's it's really kind of just like throwing all your cards down on the table, you know, pushing the chips forward in terms of of what a car can be. I mean, this is attaching your most important nameplate to a product. It has to it has to speak to that nameplate. Uh, I'm I'm really eager to see how it drives when it finally arrives. Jeff and I are actually going to be on hand at the big debut on Sunday night. So look for a lot more on the mach uh, from Sunday. But as we've been talking about how that'll rate with uh, Tesla, Tesla at the LA Auto Show is also going to be taking a little bit of a shot at Ford with its long-awaited pickup truck. And we've just found out uh, literally seconds before we started recording this podcast that it will be called the Cyber Truck. And the stylized name of it is in all caps, C Y B R T R K. I wonder if Tesla is paying for the badging by the letter. Uh, what do What do you guys think about this so far? We've seen a lot of renderings of this. I don't think the final product is going to look like it belongs on the moon, but I think it's going to be interesting to say the least. Yeah. Well, the one thing I will say actually is that it's kind of funny. We're talking about the LA Auto Show, and neither of these cars are actually debuting at the show. They're both <laughs> debuting offhand on a different night. Um, though Ford will be at the show, Tesla won't. Um, but yeah, I think it's... Man, this truck is... We've seen so many renders, like you said, Brandon, to sort of... Some more extreme than others. Right. Some definitely more extreme than others. Um, to give it, like, I I hope it's as radical as everybody thinks it's going to be. But I'm kind of feeling like it's going to be a letdown, at least visually. Like, I don't think it's going to be as crazy and extreme as a lot of these renders make it out to be. If it's not, then why call it the Cybertruck, though? Because that's... Because that's, Elon that's Musk a really good and point. Tesla and, you know, I feel like it's there. Yeah, but they could have called it the Model T. Well, I guess they couldn't have called it the Model T. <laughs> but... <laughs> they could not call it the Model T. It took me a second on that one, but... <laughs> yeah, the Model I don't know. P. Sure, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Should Tesla be worried about the Mach-E should Ford and Ram and Chevrolet and even Toyota and Nissan, should they re- really be concerned about the, the big bad cyber truck? Toyota and Nissan should be really afraid, in my opinion, just because they are kind of the outliers of the pickup truck market in the United States anyway. And those are the buyers that are going to be going after the cyber truck. Um, the big three, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, GMC, or Ram, sorry. Um, those those buyers are, in my opinion, more set in their ways. I'm not saying they're not, Tesla's not going to win any conquests, but Tesla's going to have a lot steeper of a mountain to climb when it comes to those buyers and getting them in. Whereas, in my opinion, someone who has a Tundra or a Titan might be more willing to look at the Tesla, but we'll see. Well, do we know how big this thing is going to be? Is it going to be like F-150 size or Ranger size? Or I, don't I think mean, that's know. the problem. I don't think we have any any real way of judging that. Like, it could be the size of a Nissan Frontier or it could be an F-350. Because my I mean, thing... It's, it's entirely possible that Tesla's yeah. going to come along, not with a quarter or a half ton truck, but a full one ton or one and a half ton truck. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of... Part of me feels like it could be smaller. Like, it could be like ridgeline size and it could be just like an electric ridgeline which would probably disappoint a lot of people but i don't know i see i even that that might actually be the smarter play because right, that's, that's true a, yeah that's an easier segment of the market to break into because expecting to go up against the you know the goliath that is the f-150 that's going to be a tough road well, it is far from the only EV that's showing up there, and we know that there is another member of Volkswagen's ID family of electric cars. We're going to see another concept. It's called the ID Space Vision. I think it's Vision. It's it, I, be I'm vision. hoping it's. I'm really hoping it's pronounced Vision because walking around and saying ID Space Vision feels a little bit pretentious. 
this car looks really interesting to me. I, I love the, we, we only have the, uh, a rendering of it right now, but it looks low and long. It looks wagon-like. Which yeah, is, I which wrote is the really story, exciting. and I thought the same thing. They claim that if you read the press release, they say it blends SUV and Grand Tour, but when you look at the renderings, that looks like a wagon. That's so. just a fancy way to not say wagon. <laughs> it's true, too. <laughs> Do you think that Volkswagen would really show a car this rakish and this, you know, it looks really good if they weren't going to sell it in some capacity in the United States? Do you think there's a place for an ID wagon in I'm, North America? The announcement said that a production version version is coming in late 2021, but they word it in an interesting way that... They said it would basically look something like this, but not exactly like this. So maybe, you know, it could evolve from concept to production, but they're saying a production version's coming. Yeah. I hope so. It, it looks great. I mean, the, the ID3 is, is nailed the range, you know, the range argument for Volkswagen. So they're finally figuring out how to put actual range into these products. What, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, I think a wagon still makes sense as much as people say that nobody buys them in the U.S., um, it, I think Volkswagen is is gonna produce this and hopefully bring it to the U.S. I mean, it makes sense for Europe especially, right? Because people Europeans still love wagons, and I think they still sell really well over there. Um, it's just relative a, to the U.S. Yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of whether they think it'll be worth bringing to the U.S. or not. I would say yes. I mean, I don't know. It looks cool, and so and we've seen with the like the RS6 Avant lately that people still. I mean, a small selection of people still really like wagons. Yeah, I mean, I'm I cut myself in that camp. You know, love a good wagon. But so that's that's the concept that the Volkswagen Group is showing. But there's also going to be a couple of new production variants of electric cars, and we're going to see the e-tron Sportback and the Porsche Taycan 4S. What do you guys think about these? The, the e-tron Sportback I think is especially interesting because. It's kind of that X6 crossover coupe treatment to a vehicle that isn't isn't terribly efficient with its electricity, but looks really good. It doesn't feel like a, an EV. Do you think this will, uh, you know, a sexier shape to that will appeal to customers that are otherwise turned off by the e-tron? I mean, I think it's just the natural evolution at this point. It, with every SUV, you get a coupe, you know, like version. And I guess the e-tron just isn't immune to that. I mean, this looks cool. The concept that we saw, uh, was it earlier this year with the e-tron Sportback concept? It looks cool. So, I I mean, I have no problem with it. Yeah, it's, Chris, what do you think? Yeah, it's fine. I honestly don't think it's going to move the needle at all. I think Audi's kind of first foray into the EV market is feels kind of half-baked, and I don't think this is going to do much for that. But Really? Yeah. Yeah. What, what what makes you think that? Is it just the the lack of range? That that's the major thing. Yeah, that's the primary thing. Regardless, you know, of how good it is to drive or what it's like inside, it still has to compete against Tesla, and I don't know that it does that that well. Yeah, I mean the the range is it, the range is definitely an issue, but you know, it's it, my problem with it is that they're just so, relative to Tesla or even smaller electric vehicles, they're just so energy inefficient. And I, I would really like to see Audi. Hopefully they can address that in this car. I, I don't have terribly high hopes because no. from my understanding is that this is just a new body on a familiar product. Exactly. That's what I was under the impression of as well. But the, the one that I'm really excited for is the Taycan 4S because we're actually finally getting a Porsche EV that relatively normal people could afford. You know, there aren't a lot of people that can afford a $180,000 Taycan Turbo S or, or whatever it's called, but this is the this is the Taycan you're most likely to see on the road, and they're going about it in a really interesting way, offering a standard battery pack and a slightly lo- slightly longer range battery pack with a little bit more power. And what do you guys think about this? Is this the vehicle that Porsche should have shown in the first place? Uh, I don't know. That's a tough question because you when you debut the turbo and the turbo s models you you're throwing down all these like super impressive numbers right and that's what people are looking at first you're looking at this ridiculous range and zero to 60 time and then you kind of quietly eke out the 4s you know later to where the the hype has sort of died down i think that's the 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 approach that makes sense 
from an internet, you know, everybody gets their stuff right away on the internet. Like that's what they want to see, just big numbers. But this is definitely going to be the one that everybody buys. Like this is the mainstream version and it's going to make the most sense, you know, from a buyer standpoint, I think. Yeah, and Jeff. it's not exactly a slouch. I mean, it's 563 horsepower. It gets to 60 in 3.8 seconds. Like, it's still a hell of a lot faster than than a lot of cars on the road. Were, we, were you going to say, Chris? No, I was just going to agree with Jeff completely that, you know, this is going to be the one that sells in volume, but they were smart to come out with show off the Turbo and Turbo S first, just because that one has kind of the headline grabbing figures, get people interested, and then now they can start showing them that, there are more affordable models out there. Do you guys think there's room below the Taycan for an even more, you know, a, a rear drive only model perhaps? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. I think so, especially for certain markets and areas. I bet in your like Miami's or LA's that would work. Yeah. I Jeff, agree what about that. you? Yeah, there's definitely room. I mean, especially the way Porsche's lineup is now with every, with all the trims and options that they have, there's definitely going to be room underneath this one for another one. So carrying on with the EV theme, one of the cars I, I'm really kind of like under the radar excited about is the updated Hyundai Ionic, which looks really, really good. It's It's got a very nice uh, mid-cycle update. And I've seen this car in person and it it's, it looks darn good. What, what do you guys think of the, the new look of this car? I like this whole platform, which is also, you know, Kia Niro. Um, these two cars have always been really good and sort of underrated, I think. They're really good to drive, too. I mean, they, yeah. they the Ionic Hybrid and Ionic Electric are really enjoyable cars to drive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're both super good to drive. Um, I think the facelift is, you know, interesting. It makes it look better. Uh, and then plus you see like the Sonata with that crazy, you know, radical new design that everybody loves. So it makes sense. Um, uh, it'll be good. I mean, there's nothing really super interesting about it to me, to be honest, but it, it's a solid little hybrid. It's efficient. I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And wh what do you think, Chris? Uh, sorry guys, this one does nothing for me. I, <laughs> I don't think it's attractive. I haven't driven it, so I can't comment from that perspective, but uh, this one's not for me. Well, if we want to talk about something that is is not attractive, uh, get ready for the Genesis G90 and all of its grill. <laughs> there is there, there is so so much grill on this car, and it's it's an incredibly bold take on the part of of Genesis to go with something like this. I I think it's going to be one of the more polarizing cars of the show. What do you what do you guys think? I love the way this car looks. I don't know what you guys are talking about. That thing looks great. Hey, I, I, knew, said I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. The grill and the wheels and the headlights. Oh, I do I like the it. wheels. Yeah, the wheels are it's, good. Well, I really like that this car, it, and this has been the case with the Genesis G90, even before it was a Genesis product, when it was a Hyundai Equus, it was always a vehicle that was overwhelmingly about luxury. There was no sporting pretension here. It was always a pure luxury sedan. And looking at that, I mean, I see hints of Bentley Mulzahn in the roof line. I, I see them really leaning into that that image with this car. Chris, what do you what do you think about the uh the the overall style of this thing? It's not that bad. Like the grill is the most egregious part. It looks like someone looked at an Alfa Romeo and said, Yeah, that but more. But <laughs> But otherwise, like like you were saying, there's something less Molson to me, more um, Continental Flying Spur. But yeah, it it's fine. Like this is going to be a very good car to go to the golf course in. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic for that. And I would easily pilot this thing on like a 600 mile drive. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it'd be great for that. Comfortable too. as could be. It'd be a great road tripper. And when you're behind and the wheel, you're never going to have to see the grill, and that's. <laughs> kind of the only ugly part in my mind. So, well, I will say too that like the Equus and and the other, you know, what was the the other Hyundai that the Ge before the Genesis? It was, just the, it was just the Genesis. It was right. Hyundai Genesis. Those two were so like boring and bland. Like at least, even if you don't like the way this looks, at least it's interesting. You're never gonna mistake this for anything else. I was just gonna say that it, it is it is unquestionably. A hunt, or a Genesis product. There's no question that you'll you'll never confuse it. 
Uh, speaking of big grills, you guys know where we're going with this. Uh, let's let's talk about BMW because they are bringing a whole heap of cars to LA, and none with none with very bad grills. But still, there there are some interesting vehicles here. I wanted to start with the BMW 2 Series Grand Coupe, a car that I think looks like a German Kia Forte, and that is that is not a compliment to the Forte. It's it's this is not a good looking car. I, I don't much care for it at all. I don't like seeing the two series reduced to to this. What do, what do you feel on that, Jeff? Because you've actually you've driven this, haven't you? I've driven it. I've seen it in person, and I kind of love it. Like something about it. I don't know. When you see it in person, especially in the color that we have on the website, which is the teal with like the bronze, you know, accents. It looks almost like a concept car. Like the the angles and the edges of it are just so like thick and with two c's uh it's just so <laughs> like i don't know something about the proportions of this car work uh, that said really, I have driven... that's, my, that's one of my biggest issues that the, the, that the proportions don't work for me in what especially way? from the rear three quarter yeah it's, it's a little... just it's just a visually cumbersome car it is it's a little funky but i guess it's kind of love it or hate it um and i like it i don't know but i will say that it doesn't drive that well. At least the prototype did. So this is this is the same platform as it's it's the BMW Global Front Drive platform. So you know, uh, two series Active Tour in Europe and the whole line of like new minis and whatnot. And so it, it, it's a front drive BMW. It is uh, in the U.S. We only get the all wheel drive one at least. Oh, uh, well, that's saving you know small races. Right. Yeah, but the platform, it, it's just, it doesn't feel great. If, if you're driving a BMW, you want something a little more active and sporty, and this doesn't feel like that. It's totally fine. I, I, people will buy the hell out of it, I think. But Oh, yeah, it's going to sell like hotcakes. Yeah. So I haven't driven it, but I got to ask you. So looking at this thing, it it's fine. Like, it's it's not that bad. But I purely aesthetically, I would take the CLA first. Have you I'm 100% them both? with you there. Have you driven them both, Jeff? Is the CLA better to drive than the uh, 2 Series Grand Coupe? I haven't driven the CLA. Um, you dri- have you driven the A-Class? Because that's pretty much the same thing. No, I haven't driven the A-Class either. Okay. And I think, BM- I think BMW says the A-Class is a more direct competitor to this one than the CLA is. Uh, the A-Class is darn good. It's, yeah. a, it's a really, really good car. It's very well put together. I mean, it's... It, it's impressively equipped. The cabin is gorgeous. I I can't I can't think of a world. I mean, again, I haven't driven the two series yet, so I I can't say. But based purely on looks, I, I, there's not a world where I would pick the BMW over the Mercedes in this case. Yeah, a lot of the Mercedes products that I've driven, and knowing that the A class uses a lot of the same, you know, just tech and infotainment and stuff, I'd probably say that the A class is the better option. Um, but I definitely don't hate the way the BMW looks. Now, the BMW I would have is the next one we're going to discuss, which is the M2 CS, which is just a very awesome car made more awesome. And it's 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 just a more stripped-down, hardcore version of the M2 competition, and it has these big, beautiful, bronzish, goldish wheels and more power. There's 444 horsepower in this tiny little car, and it's just going to be a friggin rocket ship that's exactly what it is that's exactly what it'll be um hopefully it will be a good successor to the 1m and you'll actually be able to get one affordably in a few years rather than the 1m that's held its value like nothing else so we'll see is this, the 1M is better looking than this. What were you going to say, Jeff? Is this like the swan song, though? Are they done with the M2? Or? I mean, I got to imagine with the 2 Series Grand Coupe coming along and the, the entire shift to front drive or all-wheel drive in the U.S. that, you know, we won't see... Maybe they'll do a CSL. I, that'd be that'd be really cool. But how much more can they squeeze out of, out of this vehicle? Yeah, probably not much more. I, I'm sure there's room for more power, but I already think... I mean, I thought the normal competition was... The normal M2 competition was already a little bit overpowered for for its chassis. So adding adding more power here and then even more down the line might be a little bit much. The other one, the other big BMW, the sporty BMW that's going to be showing up there is the M8 Grand Coupe, and this is I I love this. I love it in purple, which is the image that we have on MotorOne.com. I think this is the only color they sell it in. It's it's great. What do you what do you guys think? 
Yeah, the the color is great. I mean, just the it's, pro- it's such a good color. It's such a good color. The proportions of this car look great. I don't know. I don't really have a strong opinion on the 8 series in general. The the regular 8 series doesn't do it for me. I drove the M8 competition briefly last week and it didn't do it for me. I don't know. I'm hoping this is more of like a big GT car because I guess that's sort of what the the regular M8 is, but with four doors it makes more sense to me. I think that's it's it's good that they're adding the four door model because if you look at it, I mean Past Grand Coupes have always been really, really tight on rear headroom. This one doesn't look like it's going to be too bad of a place to, to hang out. And But I, I do agree with you. I've driven the M850i. I haven't driven an M8 yet. But even the 850i was – it was fine. It I, I think I'd rather have a Lexus LC or a Mercedes S-Class Coupe. But it just, it just kind of lacked a little bit of emotion. So maybe this will be with its, you know – in purple will have a little bit more emotion to it. What, what's, your, what's your take, Chris? It's a gorgeous car. I'll never be able to afford one. Hopefully I'll get to drive <laughs> one someday. But I mean, yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. As, like you guys are saying, especially that purple that kind of borders on burgundy in a certain way. It, yeah, it, great looking, probably fun to drive. They also have a launch edition in like this crazy green color. I don't remember exactly what it's oh, called. But it's I like, love that green is coming back on cars. It's great. Yeah, it's like almost like a somewhere between like a mint green and just like a normal green with the gold wheels that's a that's a good look too all right so that's most of what we're expecting at the show but what do we think is do we think there's going to be any surprises is there anything that you guys are really hoping will just randomly like a ford gt at the detroit auto show moment that just completely out of the blue comes along and just steals the show i'm thinking that this karma concepts will be super interesting something about Karma, I mean, Karma has their own set of issues, but they uh, they just released a concept a few months ago that was really good looking, like an open top. Uh, I don't remember what the heck it was called. But it was the SC1, I believe. And the then SC1. The SC2. SC2. So now we're seeing the SC2 coupe concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this, I mean, just from the teaser... It it's, looks it's sexy. It looks pretty sleek. I don't know. Yeah. It looks like a bi- it looks like it has like a big long hood and then a almost like a like a Mercedes AMG GT or something like that. I mean, it basically it looks like it's going to be a coupe version of the SC1. If right. you kind of look at the SC1 and just imagine a roof on top of it, it's kind of looks like it's going to be that. Yeah. What about you, Chris? Are you expecting any any surprises? I'm not expecting any. I think we've kind of heard about whatever's going to come. I'm not expecting anyone to bring out something super surprising. I will say the car that I'm most interested to learn more about, and I think this is going to shock both of you, is the RAV4 PHEV. <laughs> and, okay. that's, that's a super important car, actually. Like, and, that's... Yeah. and let me explain why. Toyota is saying that, quote unquote, it is the most powerful RAV4 yet. So if that's to be, if that's true, then that's means it's even more powerful than the v6 model from the 2000s that had 270 horsepower so that means it's if it's above that in a rav4 that's a plug-in hybrid that could just be a really fun daily driver maybe and i well, can't um, wait and to imagine, find out imagine more. Imagine it with the instant on electric torque too i mean sure. so it's it's will absolutely be faster than that than that car was which is which is really exciting. I I, I love the idea I, that automakers are really embracing plug-in hybrids, and I think this vehicle is one that, for a lot of people, it'll be their first step into electrification, into a vehicle with a plug. And, and if it's got you know, if that means two seventy five, two eighty horsepower, that's going to be a ton of fun in that car. So oh yeah, we'll see. Especially with all wheel drive. Oh yeah, so, put it put it in the snow. That'll be a riot. So the one that I'm really excited for, and this is this is based on what we've already seen with the Kia Optima, is the South Korean brand is bringing a surprise mystery vehicle to the auto show. We we don't know what this is. We have a story. Chris, you wrote this story. I wrote the story. About- it's actually based on our colleague Greg Fink. He uh, was talking with them, and he was busy, so I ended up writing up up the story. Um, from what his impression was talking to them, he thinks it's a production vehicle. He does not think it's a concept, but we don't know. He said that was just totally based on kind of the tenor of the voice of the person he was talking to. So we'll see. It could be anything. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for that. I, I love that there are automakers still keeping their cards close to their chest and not, you know, killing us to death with teasers. 
Yeah, so no teasers for that one. It just we'll just find out in a few yeah, days. <laughs> it's great. I it's back to how auto shows used to be. So what do you guys think will be the star of the show? We've talked about just about everything that's going to be there. What do you think is going to be the one that when we look back in six months and you talk about the LA Auto Show, what's the one that's still going to stand out in your memory? I think it has to be Mach E, right? There's there's a lot of good stuff, I think, this year, especially with Detroit sort of moving out of the way and, and leaving more room for LA. Um, but I still think Mach E is going to be the, the one that everyone talks about, you know, months from now. It's it's a big move for Ford. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm with you on that. I'm I'm super excited for this vehicle and what it will mean for Ford as a brand. What it'll mean for Mustang as a brand. It's it's kind of a, a brave new world for for Ford to be doing this. So I re- I hope it succeeds. I I hope it does well. I I'm really excited to see it on Sunday night and see what the the response is from the public on it. And Ford is opening reservations on. Sunday night. So hopefully in a week or so, we'll have an idea of just how many pre-orders the company got. Chris, what are you looking, thinking will be the, the bit standout? So I agree with you guys that Maki has, it could be it. I think we can't discount the Tesla Cybertruck. A, it's called the te- the Cybertruck. B, if you've <laughs> watched um, Elon's Twitter, he's kind of alluded to it being real. He's made Blade Runner references recently because I don't so Blade Runner the movie takes place in Los Angeles in November 2019. So it I just wonder if it's going to be as wild as he's kind of implying that it is. Like if it turns out to be like some Sid Mead designed pickup truck, it could I, for lack of a better word, it could like break the internet. So we'll see. Oh no! Don't break the internet. He better not ruin that movie for me. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it this weekend because it takes place this month. So yeah, it's a it's still great. Uh, well, we'd love to hear what you think about the LA Auto Show and what we're expecting, and what we're going to see, and what ends up happening at the show. For that, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Motor One Com where the discussion will continue. And of course, on our website, motorone.com, where you can find us in the comments. And we're all there, and we tend to interact with you readers pretty regularly. Coming up, we'll find out what we've all been driving this week. Before the break, though, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts from. Why not hit the subscribe button now so you can never miss a show? The final segment of this week's show is what we have been driving this week. We're going to go around the table and talk about what each of the editors has been driving. This week, we're going to start with Mr. Jeff Perez, who has been driving something quite interesting. Jeff, take it away. Yeah, so I drove last week the Rolls-Royce Cullinan Black Badge, which is, I mean... Awesome. <laughs> oh, it's every, every bit as good as you imagine it is. Like, it's ridiculous. So what happened was uh, I went up to South Carolina with BMW to see their facilities, and they did a test fest thing where we get to drive a bunch of their product. And I had never driven a regular Cullinan, so they had one there for us to, to test before we got in the black badge. So I took that out for, like, almost two hours and just drove around South Carolina in a Cullinan, and it was the best thing ever until I got in the black badge the next day, which is just it's crazy. So so what, what sets the black badge apart then? Yeah, so the black badge, um, it gets some visual treatments. So like the the grill, the Spirit of Ecstasy badge, um, and some other stuff, they get high gloss black chrome finish rather than just the regular chrome finish. Uh, they get new wheels, new brakes, better paint, some interior stuff. And then they tweak the engine to 600 horsepower and 664 pound-feet of torque. So that big, giant 6.7 liter V12, it was powerful already, but it feels so much better here. I think just the application, um, the uh, the transmission, they tweaked, they made it a little, it's, it's more like a sport transmission versus the regular Cullinan. Um, they tweaked the suspension a little bit so it doesn't feel as big and floaty as the regular one it's just such a good car it's amazing so 
one of my questions about it was, do you think that people are going to buy it because it's more under the radar? Because looking at the images of it, it doesn't look as, it, it's not as many, as immediately like in your face as a normal Cullinan is, mainly due to the lack of, lack of chrome. Do you think that this is, you know, kind of the stealthy choice? Yeah, I think it is. So I, one of the one of the big things that they highlighted with Black Badge, which is only like three years old, the Black Badge lineup, was that they saw all these people taking their Cullinans to just get these crazy colors or, you know, whatever, all this treatment. And Rolls-Royce is like, you know, we could do it better and we can make money off of it. And so that's what they did. And they're already selling a ton of them. I, uh, just the Wraith and the Dawn and the Ghost Black Badges, they sell... Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it was, you know, a ridiculous percentage of of those models versus the regular ones. So the Cullinan, which which is already their best selling car, is going to be, you know, even how much, better. How much more one. are they charging for for the black badge? Uh, three eighty two for the black badge. Whoa! Which is uh, and the almost, normal one starts at like three thirty five. I want to say yeah, it's like, it's about like fifty grand more than the regular one. But I don't know if you're paying. Three hundred and thirty grand for an SUV. Does it really matter if you right. pay an extra fifty the extra grand? Extra fifty grand. That's nothing. Right. That's not going to push push you over the edge. So, I think it's totally worth it. It's great. It's, and it's very cool. I almost forgot the most important part is this is the first Cullinan with the starlight headliner, which is like the uh, the starry sky in the car. It's awesome. I mean, you could just so- sit back and just live in that car. I, I drove the Cullinan in the first drive, and I was really disappointed that none of them had that headliner. Ignoring yeah. the fact that I only drove it during the day, I was mm-hmm. I was still really bummed that it wasn't there. So I'm I'm thrilled to hear that it's finally there. Are they adding that to all Cullinans as an option, or just the Black Badge? They didn't say, um, but it it was on the Black Badge we drove as an option. Um, so I assume it's going to make its way to regular all the Cullinans. I mean, why would you not want that if you're a Rolls Royce owner? I completely owner? agree. I mean, why, if you're going to go full Rolls Royce, you got to have that. Exactly. So this week, I've been driving a car that I've I've been pretty excited about. I I've been looking forward to getting into this, and it showed up in the most garish possible trim. It's the uh, Volkswagen Arteon, and the color is reminiscent of the Phoenix Gold that BMW offered on older M3s. It's kind of a metallic yellowish, greenish. I've heard people describe it in uh, not so polite ways uh, involving bodily fluids, but it's it's a really like eye catching, striking color. And I gotta say, it it reminds me of a better Volkswagen CC, which is kind of probably the idea. It's a very stylish car. It's it looks much better in person. I don't think it has a lot of presence in photography, but. In person, I absolutely adore the way that this looks. And you've you've driven one as well, right, Jeff? No, I haven't. Uh, Greg drove it on the first drive, and and he liked it. As a CC owner, I think he had a lot of very good things to say about the Ardeon. So yeah, I mean, I I get why. It's it 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 also reminds me of the European Passat. I mean, some of the interior bits here and there. It feels a little bit more premium than our Passat. A little bit more likable. It feels more special. I guess is is the, how I feel about it every time I get into it, and I think it's fairly priced for what it is. The one that I have starts at about forty three thousand dollars, as tested is forty four thousand. So it feels like a very nice, stylish package if you want a near luxury car that looks this good. The only thing I'm not crazy about is I, I still don't care for some of the tech implementation inside. It doesn't, uh, especially the infotainment s- system, is just not as not as nice as what you'll get in some of the competition, especially some of the German competition like Mercedes Benz and BMW. And you know, hopefully that is something that Volkswagen will fix going forward. I do like that it has Volkswagen's digital cockpit, which is their version of Audi virtual cockpit. Uh, it's a great system. It looks really good, but it kind of it kind of overshadows the the main touchscreen interface. Is there any reason to buy a Passat when this car exists? I mean, short of wanting a bigger cabin for less money, I don't think there is. And at that point, wouldn't you just buy a crossover? Yeah. I well, mean, would you? Would you say this is a luxury car? Or would you say it's near luxury? Like, what's the I'd competitor say to this? It it feels near luxury. It's one of those weird cars that kind of. 
kind of falls in the middle. It, it, it's 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 a bigger vehicle, but it drives like a smaller vehicle, and it's definitely nicer, but it has a slightly lower price. But it, I would definitely compare this with a maybe a four series Grand Coupe, like a budget four series Grand Coupe, or a you know a pricier, bigger CLA. It's it's just a very likable shape and. And it slots into a good place in the market that I think uh, I think will do well for Volkswagen. Hopefully, that's going to be a wrap on this week's episode of the Motor One Podcast. It was a relatively short one because we spent a lot of time talking about the LA Auto Show. You can keep up on all the news from the Auto Show at MotorOne.com. Well, you can also see the musings of myself at at Brandon Turkus on Twitter, from Jeff Perez at Not a Boat Captain on Twitter, and from Chris Bruce at. Chris Bruce, 1985, no spaces, no hyphens, no nothing. Thanks to both Jeff and Chris for joining me on this week's pod. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Been great being here. Yeah, great. And we'll see you all next week. 